in this amazing game, Emmanuel Lasker gets himself pinned on purpose and then plays back-to-back -back sacrifices and then a great sacrifice at the end in the king's side attack. An amazing game. His opponent was the great Harry Nelson Pillsbury. He died before the GM title was given out, but he was definitely one of the greatest players in the world at the time this game was played. He had the white pieces. Emmanuel Lasker had black. Let us jump right in. Pillsbury begins with d4. Lasker responds with d5. And very quickly, we have a queen's gambit declined on the board. Most common these days is bishop to g5. But Pillsbury plays knight to f3. And Lasker immediately attacks the center with c5, putting pressure on the central structure. Uh, more common today would be to just take the pawn on d5, and you could have a tarash or a semi-tarash with the knight capturing. But uh, in this game, Pillsbury plays bishop to g5, trying to keep that tension in the position. Lasker takes on d4, and Pillsbury takes with the queen. The reason is if he takes with the knight, then after e5, kicking the knight, uh, black seems to get in equal position here. Uh, the queen keeps that uh, e pawn from advancing. Knight to c6 gains a tempo against the queen. And the queen goes to h4. Uh, today, the move bishop takes f6 is preferred. Uh, and that just seems to lead to equality. Black's threatening the white queen, but white's threatening the black queen. But instead, Harry Nelson Pillsbury plays queen to h4. Now, he's built a lot of pressure on this f6 knight. So Lasker has to do something about that. And he plays bishop to e7 to relieve that pressure. Now, here Pillsbury chooses a very aggressive line of play. He actually castles long, and his king is quite a bit exposed over here on c1. Uh, the problem with e3, trying to liberate this bishop at f1, is the move queen to b6. Attacking b2 is actually quite strong here, and black already seems to have a, a little pull. So uh, Harry Nelson Pillsbury castles long. Now queen to a5, to get out of the aim of that rook, but also to put some pressure on the knight at c3, as well as the a2 pawn, and just put that queen around white's king, make him a little bit uh, nervous there. Um, e3 was played by uh, Pillsbury. Uh, one possibility was actually to take on d5 twice and then play e4, opening up the center very quickly, trying to take advantage of the fact that Lasker's king is in the middle of the board. After some exchanges, uh, you have a fairly equal position, but with a lot of tension. Uh, but instead, Pillsbury plays e3 to liberate his bishop, bishop to d7. And Lasker has completed his development. He has all four minor pieces developed, although he's not castled yet. Uh, and his king seems to be a little bit safer. Black probably has a slight edge in this position. White plays king to b1, a standard idea when castling queen side to help protect the pawn at a2. And here Lasker makes a very strong move. He plays the move h6. He basically places himself in a pin. I mean, he plays h6 to kick the bishop at g5, but he can't take the bishop, because if he does, then the queen takes the rook at h8. Well, why then does he play this? Well, here's the reason. He's forcing white to make a choice. Pillsbury can either take on f6 and give black the bishop pair, but if he doesn't want to do that, then he has to leave his queen here on h4. The queen can't move. It's trapped in place. So what Lasker has done by get, putting himself in a pin is basically make it so white either has to give up the bishop pair or have an immobile queen. First, white takes on d5. Uh, knight d5 doesn't really change too much. You, all, a bunch of exchanges on d5. But black has an edge, as you can see, threatening a2, bishop coming to, to f5. Uh, um, but he goes ahead and plays takes with the e pawn. The idea being, if you're going to have an isolated queen's pawn, you want to keep as many pieces on the board as possible. And uh, Pillsbury goes ahead and blockades on d4. Makes sense, of course. And now black castles. And now there's no longer a pin on this h file. And uh, white has to do something. If he plays the bishop to f4, then after knight to e4, he's just lost. I mean, the, the bishop attacks the queen, and there's going to be a catastrophe on c3 with the queen and knight hitting that knight. Queen h5, knight c3. White is just lost there. Um, if he tries to sacrifice that bishop for two pawns in the attack, the problem is after the queen takes on h6, knight goes to e4, white really can't get any other pieces in to assist the white queen, and black is just better with the extra material. So he acquiesces and takes on f6, and now Lasker has 
the bishop pair that he was after. But Pillsbury's queen can now move, and he moves it to h5, attacking the d5 pawn twice with his knight and queen. First Lasker takes on d4. Now white will have uh, an isolated pawn as well. d4 and d5 are both isolated. Pillsbury's attacking d5, so Lasker defends it with his bishop, goes to e6. And now Pillsbury plays a very aggressive idea, f4. What he wants to do, obviously, is play f5, kick the bishop from e6 away, and maybe even follow up with something of a pawn avalanche. The bishop can go to d3, and he would have a very strong attack. But uh, Lasker really was an incredible player, and he plays this move. He plays the move rook a to c8, anticipating the move f5, but with a little surprise. I have this arrow drawn to the knight, so that gives away a little bit. Um, he's threatening a devastating attack here. And Pillsbury does go ahead and play f5, and that allows Lasker to play his first conception. Rook takes c3, sacrificing the exchange. And if that exchange is taken, he, all he has to do is play bishop to d7. And the th pressure on white's uh, queen side is unbearable, even though white's up in exchange. Here's an example. Uh, if he plays rook to c1 to defend the c3 pawn, then rook to c8 attacks it a second time. You see the queen. Queen and rook both attacking. Then if queen to f3 to defend it a second time, Lasker would have this strong move, bishop to d4. Now there are three pieces attacking uh, the c3 pawn. And if it were to, if it were to take the bishop, then bishop to f5, check. Uh, the queen can't take the bishop because uh, it's checked. And that would be, uh, that would be curtains. Uh, and if bishop to d3, then queen to b6 check, king to a1, queen takes pawn check, and you're attacking this bishop twice. King b1, bishop to d3 check, and uh, the only way to stave off immediate mate is by actually giving up the queen. He'd be, he'd be destroyed. Uh, so that just doesn't work. So he goes ahead and takes the bishop on e6 instead. He does not take the offered material. So how does Laska respond? He offered his rook once, right? Well, now he offers it, boom, a second time. Rook to a3. And the threat, of course, is to just take the a2 pawn. So uh, white needs to do something about that. I mean, if he takes the rook, then queen to b6 check is the threat. Um, if king to c1, then just bishop to g5 check. And uh, with the queen and rook coming in, his king is, is finished. Um, if king to c2, then rook c8 check, king d2, queen to d4 check. And again, it's just too much peace activity. Um, Bishop b5 is probably the best move, giving up a piece. He's up a rook, so giving up a minor piece leaves him in an okay position. But queen takes king a1 but and queen to c4. And black is a bit better with pressure on d4, but this is probably white's best line uh, in that position. But instead, he goes ahead and takes on f7, ignoring the rook, the right, the right choice. Rook takes f7, and now he goes ahead and takes the rook. Queen to b6 check. Now here, king to a1 is bad news because bishop to d4 check, rook d4, queen d4, and we've seen this type of line after the king moves over, the rook goes over, and, uh, and uh, it's, it's trouble, big trouble for, uh, for white. Uh, so bishop to b5, the same idea of giving up the minor piece to connect the rooks and try to defend. Queen takes b5 check, king c2, then rook to c7, king d2, queen b2 check, and white's going to get mated. Very, very soon, these pieces are all over, all over the position. So he plays king to a1, uh, queen to c4, queen to g4, rook to e7 is the winning idea for black, but Lasker does not play that. Uh, instead, he plays the move rook to c7, which seems like, it, it does kind of look like the best move on the board, but it actually throws the win away, strangely enough. Um, rook to d2, a very strong move from Pillsbury. Not only does he defend d4, he also keeps that rook out of c2, a really strong idea. Rook to c4, putting pressure on the d4 pawn. And here, uh, the winning idea for, not winning, but uh, the idea that keeps white in the game is rook to e1, threatening queen to e8 check, which would exchange queens. That was the way to maintain the balance. But instead, Pillsbury plays rook h to d1, to overprotect this d4 pawn. Now, rook to c3 is played by Laster. His best move here is queen to c6. That was puts a lot of pressure on white. 
He's actually threatening rook to c1 check and, and a quick mate. So a queen to c6 was the best move. But instead he plays rook to c3 uh, and queen to f5 by Pillsbury. Now, believe it or not, white is actually a bit better. He, his queen can come back and defend. It controls g1 or b1, excuse me. And uh, for the moment, he's a little bit better with his extra exchange. Queen to c4 is played by Lasker. Again, putting pressure on this pawn. King to b1 was the best move, which keeps the advantage. But instead, he plays the move king to b2. And now, boom, another sacrifice. Rook takes a3, a very, very powerful move. And uh, if he takes the rook, then queen to c3 check, king to a4. And there's a two-move mate from this position. Can you see it? I'll give you a second. That's right. B5 check, which forces king takes pawn. Then queen to c4 check. That's just three moves. King to a5 and bishop to d8 is mate. So that's the idea behind this rook takes a3 move. So queen to e6 check is played by Pillsbury. King to h7. Uh, if queen to f5, white does not have a perpetual. The king can go to g8. And after queen to e6, he just goes to h8. And now there's no way to continue delivering checks after that move. The queen is no longer able to check on this diagonal. Uh, but in this position, uh, Pillsbury sort of collapses a little bit. He makes a mistake. He's in trouble already. He is lost here. Uh, but he goes ahead and grabs the rook. And we actually know what happens because we saw it in the earlier variation. Queen to c3 check, king to a4. And you remember the next move? b5 check. That's right. King takes b5. Queen to c4 check, king to a5. Now bishop to d8, which is not mate, uh, but the record of this game shows that it continued. Uh, then one more move. White can play queen to b6, blocking that check. But then bishop takes queen was mate. A self, an intentional pin, three sacrifices, a brilliant attack, a wonderful game. Thank you for joining us at Chess Dog. See you again soon.